As we continue to learn that the Bible holds so much relevance in our day and age, that the Bible is not just a historical document, but a living document that lives throughout the ages. Because it is a living document, as a book, it establishes us in present truth. And this is what we're setting out to do, establishing you in present truth as we study the Bible together. In this particular installment, we're going to go through the prophetic books, book by book. Prophets transmit the word of the Lord through written, oral, vision, acting, and or even music. To some, this might be a dramatic display of professing the word of the Lord, and maybe it is. However, this is how God uses his prophets to give the word life. So let's just jump right in and continue our journey of exploring the many facets in a much deeper a meaningful way. Welcome to our fifth installment in The Human Project, How to Study the Bible. We're turning our attention to the prophetic books of the Bible. We want to start this installment first with a definition, and that is the definition of prophecy. So prophecy is a message that is given through a man to a person or a group of people by divine revelation. The Bible says that the prophets spoke from God as they were moved by the Spirit. So we know that it's by the prompting of the Spirit. This is in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. So therefore, a prophet is one who receives divine revelation concerning a person or a group of people or something that God wants to do within his creation that is given to that individual by divine revelation. He receives this message from God and he transmits this message. You can read more about that in Acts chapter three, verse 18. So usually God allows this prophet to have insight, divine insight to our future destiny or insight into the future. So one of the things that prophecy does, it causes the womb of the spirit in the spirit realm to begin to contract and the realms of possibilities and potentialities, they begin to collide in syncopation to heaven's plan, heaven's rhythm, heaven's timetable, and causes what people call serendipitous moment. You probably heard the word serendipity but it causes these kind of serendipitous moments in the future to occur. So prophecy also activates us into our destiny by helping us to make the right decision concerning our destiny. It points us to uh, fields or industries or professions which God has chosen for us to lead, to dominate, to prosper, or to succeed in. Bible prophecy is not limited to foretelling or seeing into the future and then sharing that revelation in the present. Some of God's messages that he downloaded was actual co correction. It was warning and throughout the prophets or the Bible books or the books of the Bible that are prophetic in nature, you will not only see God speaking about the future, He's also going to address and adjust their behavior and give them an opportunity to make the necessary adjustment so that they live a life of blessing. So the whole reason why God gives prophecy is because he wants us to live a blessed life. And he wants us to heed all the warnings that he's going to give us, whether they're warning of future calamity, um, if they refuse, but the whole idea is that God wants to bless us. So the actual outcome or the actual course that our life follows or our destiny follows is based on decisions that we make. And you can find that out in Deuteronomy 28, verse uh, 15. Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, and also Deuteronomy 30, uh, verse 19 and 20. And so it's all about a decision 
that we make, whether we believe God and believe his prophets, so shall we prosper. And if we don't believe and if we don't obey and if we don't align our thoughts and actions and behaviors and habits accordingly with, of course, God's plan uh, based on the laws that he has left for us and his statutes and his principles, biblical principles, then the natural outcome will be a life that is full of struggle and hardship and calamities. So how did prophets actually receive information from God? They often um, were in prayer or God spoke directly to them, but then they had to transmit this message. And um, they used several methods to transmit the, math, m the message that God gave them. Some wrote, some, there was a transmission of drama. So there were those that used sign language. Um, Ezekiel, he was a, uh, an actor, so you had this prophetic actor. Um, there was oral communication. Um, there is vision and mental guidance where God actually inspired. The Bible says that the whole Bible is God inspired. So there is this supernatural guidance that goes on where God literally breathes his word into our spirit. And then when we exhale, what we exhale is the message from God. So when we look at the Bible, we want to look at these prophetic books, and we're going to start with the book of Isaiah. And I call this the book of hope. So God sends the prophet Isaiah to warn Israel of the future judgment, but he also gives them hope because he balances the message that is given with the hope because the king is going to come. And, and um, he's going to come and he's going to bear the sins of many. And he encouraged them with this, this, this message that you hear uh, many, many times. He was wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. So it's a message that warns Israel of future judgment, but it gives hope because they're saying, he tells the individuals or tells the nation of Israel that their, their redeemer is going to come who has bared the sins. Yes, you're sinning, but there's a redeemer that has bared the sins of us all. So the second book that I want to look at is the book of Jeremiah. And this is the weeping prophet. Um, there's all sorts of conspiracy theories that are not theories, but God will send prophets that have insight into the future and there's warning. So, you know, today we are listening to conspiracy theories. This is going to happen. That is going to happen. But this is not a conspiracy theory. Jeremiah, this is a prophetic word and it's going to happen. So he warns Israel of this Babylonian, capti Babylonian captivity, but then he gives them hope. There's going to be a start and there's going to be a finish. It's going to be 70 years, but God has a greater plan for you that whatever's happening that's going to happen to you, you're going to come out better and not bitter. And so he's called the weeping prophet because he, through tears, is prophesying the judgment of God over a nation that he loves, he absolutely loves. And he's telling them that there's going to come a time for um, their destruction. In the first book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah has this um, occasion where he is, he is speaking to God. So God reveals himself to him and tells him, hey, your assignment is to be a prophet and your prophecies are going to be global and you're going to be this, this um, global prophetic voice. And he's like, who, me? I'm not too sure that you know who I am. And then God recognizes that he's a little timid and God is encouraging him, don't be afraid. Your prophecies are going to be strong and people may not respond to you as a prophet in a positive manner, but I'm gonna make your face like flint. 
And then he just says to God, look, I can't prophesy. You know, I've never been to the school of the prophet. I've never been trained. I don't have a spiritual father. I don't have a spiritual mentor. And God says, well, I will be your mentor. And he men mentors him and shows him the protocol for prophecy and how to understand visions and, and how to understand the insight that God has given him. And he becomes a very strong prophet. And then Lamentations, again, is a collection of the lamenting of the fall of J Jerusalem and the Babylonian attack. And again, this book um, is written by uh, Jeremiah. So if you read the two books together, it's the prophecy of Babylon uh, and the captivity, and they're going to be in captivity for 70 years, but then there's hope at the end. And of course, the Book of Lamentation is made up of about five poems, each of them his lamenting the grief um, before it even happens. And it's like this eulogy. It's like a, a funeral and it's mourning um, the loss, the loss of a nation. And the he 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 just just writes these these in this poetic language, but it's all his lamentation. The next book is Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, brilliantly written, written because it's it's a book that talks about um, what happens when catastrophe actually strikes. And God begins to speak through this prophet and uses him as this prophetic actor and a pantomime. Pentamimer. And we think, you know, that pentamiming is pretty modern, but it's not. Ezekiel prophesied and he pentamimed a lot of his prophecies. And he was a prophet, but he was also a priest. So it's interesting how it's, it, you know, God combines this uh, prophetic gift and place it, places it upon this priest. And um, Ezekiel was exiled in Babylon. This is like 597 BC or somewhere thereabout. So his um, ministry just extends over many years, um, over 20 years, 23 years or something like this. And he has these dramatic visions where he sees the likeness of God and he's keenly aware every time he's prophesying of the presence of God. And he has this prophetic insight that, that God, although it, it appears as if he may have forgotten his beloved people, he had not because he was still very active in the our human uh, um, affairs. So Ezekiel not only prophesies during this exile period, but he prophesies hope. So he's able to say, listen, um, let me share you with you what I know about God and this vision or a series of visions that God is giving me. We are intro introduced to the 27th book of the Bible, which is the book of Daniel. And this is the book Daniel versus Babylon, or, or Kingdom Against Kingdom. So you have this figure, um, and he's a strong figure. He's a victim. He's a victim of human trafficking. And he gets this um, scholarship to attend the University of Babylon. And God gives him a brilliant mind, and he ascends um, through scholastic genius and intelligence until he gets the king's attention. And then he moves up into a, a very high ranking position over the, this Persian empire um, and um, Babylonian empire. So you have Daniel, this, this powerful prophet that is assigned by God in, to operate or work in government. And he's recognized as one of the most brilliant um, government officials that ever existed in Babylon as well as Persia. And he has a series of prophetic visions 
that includes um, the coming of the Lord. And so when you read this book, you're reading it from a kingdom perspective and how he um, lives counter, counter culture, but yet God allows him to defy the odds and to maintain respect, even though his lifestyle is the exact opposite of the Babylonians. They were forced to respect him. He has some companions and we see how culture was, had the power of culture. And we know that culture is about education, sports, entertainment, music, um, uh, um, fashion, uh, movies, all of that is culture and culture is there to shape the minds, to control the minds of the masses. And here is someone who is moving through culture, not being affected by culture, but affecting culture. So where culture is shaping the minds of the masses, he is influencing culture by living counterculture. The book of Daniel again, Daniel is in exile. Um, he's chosen to serve in Nebuchadnezzar's courts. Um, and then when the Persians conquer Babylon, Daniel was given a uh, position of power and he remained faithful to God um, in a very hostile environment. So this is a great book if you wanna study it, um, how to actually survive hostile environments, whether it's a hostile workplace or whether you live in a country where it's anti-God. For instance, you may be a Christian, but living in um, a predominantly uh, Muslim environment or Buddhist environment, but God will speak to you and he will allow you to make a difference in that environment. He was a dreamer. He was thrown into the fiery furnace, the lion's den, or he was thrown into the lion's den. But we are all also familiar with the fiery furnace, the handwriting on the wall, the visions. We're familiar with Nebuchadnezzar losing his mind, suffering from me mental health issues, and how just the presence and the prayer life of Daniel really shaped the course of history, not just for his people, but for Babylon and Persia. And so God will plant you in industries so that you can be a contributor and a catalyst of the destiny of nations. The next book, book number 28, is the book of Hosea. Wow, uh, what can I say about this book? I mean, if I were to use modern day language, it's like three ways to marry a hoe or something like that. But Hosea is a prophet and he marries a prostitute by the prompting of God. And she um, is whoring around. I don't even know how else to explain this book, but she has many other outside lovers and God uses his marriage and his love for this woman that was a philanderer. That's probably a best way, better way to say it. She's this philanderer. And um, it's a picture that God gives of his people who run around after other gods and how God always is there to take them back. Hosea married a prostitute and she ran around and she was always there to take his bride back. He was, he was a man of covenant. And it's interesting because this is God's relationship, not only with Israel, but with all humanity. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, this is a fascinating book. And I often ask myself this question, uh, if God asks me to do that, uh, if, you know, I'm married, but, if he asks me to be an example of his love and the love that he has for his people, um, it, it's less about will and it's more about willingness. And he was willing to do this as a prophet. Um, book number 29 is Joel. Um, and 
I call this a book um, very simple. God is sending a plague, a locust to judge, judge Israel. Um, but God um, is gave Joel uh, just a way to communicate the foreshadowing of the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord is this great anticipation by Israel because they believe that when God um, came, he was going to judge uh, the nations that uh, prosecuted Israel and restore her back to her former glory. So really, even though it, it speaks of judgment, then Israel can make some decisions because they understood that at the end, God really wanted to restore them back to their former glory. And this is where he prophesies that the day is going to come, that I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh, Joel 2, 28, we all know that. And that day arrived in the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Um, Amos. Amos is an exciting book. You're going to hear me say that all the books of the Bible are excited. And each one of them, every time I share the history of these books and what the book is all about, I really do get excited. So Amos um, is, a, a, is this shepherd and he's a farmer and God raises him up. Probably the, uh, the mo one of the most unlikely candidates and he prophesies during the reign of Uzziah. So this is very um, interesting because we read about Uzziah in, an, in another book of the Bible. And he begins to prophesy. And he prophesies during the time that both the southern and the nor northern kingdom is pretty stable. Um, God has prospered them. They have a great king. Uh, they have some sort of um, political stability, economic stability, national stability. But then, because of the blessings of the Lord, they began to slack off and they became more corrupt. They were oppressing the poor. You know, uh, they were involved in uh, idol worshiping and corruption and their natural uh, life and spiritual life and social life became more important than their spiritual life and more important than their relationship with God. So, you know, he begins to prophesy to Israel as they begin to fall into apostasy. And he warned them, listen, you know, it is your responsibility in the midst of all this prosperity to really take care of the poor, to get involved with so social justice, and to, to really be that nation that raises the standard amongst all the nations. And Amos prophesied that God would remember his covenant with Israel, and then he was going to restore a faithful remnant. Then the book of Obadiah. Obadiah. Uh, what would I title that? I would title it, it's payback time, or payback is coming. Because Obadiah warns the nations that are neighboring um, Israel, especially Edom, that even though they plundered Jerusalem and they thought that they were going to get over, Obadiah was warning these nations, the time is going to come where, where it's going to be payback time. It's one of the shortest books in the Old Testament. And it's soon after the armies of Babylon destroys Jerusalem, conquers the people, um, is involved, Babylon is involved in human trafficking. And they occupy um, some of the villages. They leave the poorest of poor behind. And this angers the Lord. And, and Obadiah is given the task of asserting that God is a sovereign God. And he sees everything, and he is going to make you pay for what you did to his beloved people. And then the book of Jonah, and I call this the running man, and there's something fishy going on around here. Because of disobedience, he's swallowed by this great uh, fish, 
And after three days, he comes to his senses. He preaches the message uh, um, of God to the city of Nineveh that demonstrates the love of God, the love of God, not just for his people, but for all humanity. He loves all humanity. And so we see this in Jonah, and Jonah is mentioned in Matthew uh, 12, 39 to 41, um, as this historical per person. And um, when, when, when God sent Jonah to Nineveh, he just rebelled and then he repented. Um, there's this scripture, they that observe lying vanities shall forsake their own mercies. And then it goes on, but I will sacrifice um, unto the Lord. And these are the words that Jonah, Jonah spoke. So again, this is the book of Jonah. Book number 33 is the book of Micah. And this is a book where you, um, it talks about, a lot about integrity. So Micah is confronting leadership. And I believe that we need a Micah today um, that you, reminding leaders that you're a servant leader and you've got to serve with justice, not just for some, but for all. Because one day the Lord himself is going to rule with perfect judgment, but until he comes, He's relying on you. So he prophesies in Judah during the reign of Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. And uh, run about the same time as um, Isaiah. So when you read the writings of Micah, he's a contemporary of um, Isaiah. And he's just brilliant with the words and the messages that he gives their, their messages of warning, but there's messages of hope as well. So it's a nice balanced message that he's being sent to give. The next is Nahum. And Nahum is um, a book about judgment, you know, that um, God gave Nineveh, Nineveh an opportunity to turn their hearts to him and to repent but they didn't, so now Nineveh is being judged. So I love it because it balances um, what God had spoken to Jonah. Um, you've got to give people a chance. And the last thing that God will do with human beings is to bring judgment to human beings. So the next book is the book of Nahum. Jonah preached repentance in the streets of Nineveh and the capital of Assyria. And the people responded, they spirit, and they were spirit, but they went back. And then you have um, the judgment of this nation, but then you have this prophet Nahum, and he preached in a time when Nineveh would not repent. And so he's preaching this message and he uh, prophesied um, you know, one day the children of Israel is going to rejoice because Nineveh will fall. And, uh, you know, in other words, there's a time uh, to be born and a time to die. It's time for something to exist and something to not exist. And a time um, for Nineveh as a nation was going to come to an end. Then I have one of my favorite books, Habakkuk. The first chapter, it's easy to understand. He's complaining and he's saying to God, um, do you understand what's going on? Do you see what's going on? And then God sends him in chapter two and tells him to stand on the watch, on his watch and gave him a vision. He said, write the vision. Um, he wanted God to stop the injustice, stop the violence, but gave him a different way to pray that you can pray, but let's now use the vision to shape the agenda, your prayer agenda. So a lot of people pray and they're praying about the circumstance when God wants to give them this solution. And he'll give you the solution by way of vision. So write the vision and stop complaining about the problem. And that's the book of Habakkuk. The book of Zephaniah, this is book number 36. 
It's about the sovereign hand of God. And he's again warning uh, the children of Israel of the judgment. Zephaniah it speaks of the coming of the day of the Lord. He speaks when sin is going to be judged and uh, justice is going to prevail and there's going to be a remnant that will be saved. And he's really, Zephaniah is really, really giving uh, details of the end time. And he speaks um, so that every individual understands that there are consequences for everything that we do as human beings. And again, we're talking about the human project, but he calls on, on the people to seek God. Uh, Haggai is the next. So you have these um, waves of um, exiled uh, Hebrews from the Hebrew nation or Israelites returning to Jerusalem. They all didn't come back at the same time. And so he begins to rebuild the temple. And the, 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 the statements that he's making, it's, it's um, ministry of Haggai and Zechariah that, that, that completes the task. So you see Haggai and Zechariah prophesying, rebuking the people, telling them you lived in, in your penalt house, but the house of God is suffering. He wanted them to bring in <coughs> resources so that <coughs> they can build a temple that actually brings glory to God. And he was making appeal an appeal. <clears throat> and you can call it like a campaign. He was campaigning for, and it, this is a financial campaign that he had, and he was pleading with the people, please don't neglect the house of God. Then Haggai. And um, I think the book of Haggai is about priorities. Um, how to redefine your priorities. So the people had started the work, but they had abandoned the work of God, especially as it relate, relates to the restoring of the temple. And Haggai rises up and um, holds them to task and say, look, if you've started it, you've got to finish it. You cannot give up. You've got to have passion about the things of the Lord. Uh, book number 38 is the book about Zechariah. And I call this one nation under God. And so the prophet Zechariah, he calls on the nation of Israel and, and just pleads with them, please return back to God. And Zechariah has a series of visions. You've got to read them. They're fantastic. Um, he even encourages, um, you know, Zerubbabel. He encourages all these people, Zechariah, is calling on the children of, of, of Israel, encouraging them to renew their covenant with God because God keeps his covenant with them. And he talks about, you know, social justice. He, he talks about um, the Jewish inhabitants and he, he reassures them that God is a God of comfort. He really does care for you. And he wanted to rekindle their hope in the Messiah. And he speaks off a lot of promises. And then the book of Malachi, book number 39, the last book of the Old Testament. And this book is a book, again, about priorities. God has been faithful to you. Make sure you're faithful to God. And of course, we have the famous um, quotation, bring all your tithes and offering to the house of God. Prove now the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Prove him that he will not open up the windows of heaven and pour a blessing out that you would not have room enough to contain. So this is um, a call to the nation that they would repent, turn back to God, um, and respect the priesthood, which had become corrupted, bring back worship and the purity of worship, um, honor the laws, stop getting divorced, think about social justice, um, make sure you're not robbing God because God wants to give you a life where you are literally living under an open heaven. 
Thanks for tuning into this series on the Cindy Tram YouTube channel. I pray that you're enjoying this series as much as I am. The Bible is so fascinating and it brings so much life. Go back and listen to this particular teaching over and over to get the full revelation concerning the prophetic books of the Bible and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you in the process. Join the revolution by studying the Bible and reading it every day and encouraging your friends and family to do the same. Remember, all of our activities at Cindy Trim Ministries are supported by our wonderful partners like you and sponsors and contributors. And if you'd like to become one, if you're not, you can do so now by adhering to the following commercial. In the meantime, please take just a second to click the subscribe button. That way you won't miss a single life-changing video. And if you have subscribed, make sure you share. Thanks again for watching. And as always, it's a pleasure and an honor to do life with you in real time. For real. Have you heard about the Cindy Trim Ministries app? This is where you can dive into our world of ministry. Just update or download the latest version of the app for free in the Apple or Google Play Store. On the dynamic home screen, you will continuously be up to date with the latest news, empowering teachings, and live streaming services. Become the leader you were born to be and establish your own empowered life group as you watch on-demand messages and access free discussion guides for each message. There's more empowerment at every click. Engage in the latest event hosted by Dr. Trim and find out when she's going to be in a city near you. Giving is easy. Donate now by selecting the Give button inside of the app. Download the Cindy Trim Ministries app now and begin your journey of empowerment with us today.